All right, so we went to this conference yesterday, and because of that, I didn't get uh, my lesson done for today, but that's okay. Um, I was kind of inspired by um, the conference we went to yet, um, yesterday in Columbus to hear D.A. Carson speak, and we learned some new theological terms, didn't we? Theodicy. 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 What is theodicy? Well, uh, it was a very interesting three sessions. Um, okay, so we've been learning a lot of things. And yes, we're in the midst in the book of Romans looking at how to overcome sin and live righteously and that's we're breaking down the components of um, what we need to know definitions flesh sin you know desire all of these things we're going to break down and then apply that to how we overcome sin in our life and and live righteously okay um, Yesterday, as D.A. Carson said, his goal of the three talks was to um, teach how to think according to our worldview. And uh, I thought that the that the it out outright admission that he was teaching us how to think was quite quite interesting. <laughs> I think a lot of people missed that, all right, um, especially towards our world view. So another uh, word um, that uh, we learned was, well, we, theodicy and um, I've got lots of notes here that we'll be uh, discussing. Um, compatible compatibilityism was that it? Kind of a, an alternate theological term of sorts for paradox. Okay. Pretty much, even though this is a complete contradiction. Uh, you can believe it because I'm a philosopher king and I say so type of deal, okay? But anyway, we'll have a lot more to say about that conference in the future. Um, you know, there was a continual, there was a continual um, uh, mention of, um, quote, rapidly changing culture, okay? Uh, our post- Christianity culture, da 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 da. Again, let me remind people: these yo-yos have been running the show lock, stock, and barrel for more than 20 years now. Okay, but yet the results of these things are, you know, and I I do feel like the new Calvinist movement is feeding that post-Christian culture to a great degree, they are then taking those same results and using it once again to, um, uh, to promote their theology. And, their, and, and like I have written before, and I'll say it again, ever since 1970, ever since 1970, it's every year it's been a, a revival, okay? Uh, it, you know, every year they present themselves as this, this, you know, rediscovery. So we've been in rediscovery now for 41 years, <laughs> okay? And they keep selling this package to, to Christians and it continues to work. So basically, through some emails that I've gotten in the conference that we went to yesterday, I was inspired that the time has come 
um, to take all the ideas that we have learned and to be bold enough to, uh, to put it this way. And this is a project that I'm going to start. You've heard of covenant theology. You've heard of new covenant theology. Okay. Um, you've heard of biblical theology, sonship which is a sonship theology. Sonship theology. Well, I'm going to start a project where we put forth what I call gospel theology. Okay. And I like that because it hijacks uh, the gospel everything lingo from our time. So this is a project that um, I am going to start. The tenants are listed here, okay? And it'll be a project that I'm going to put up on the internet that people can participate in. There will be tenants added, tenants and elements added, some taken away. This is the get us going, and you see that, um, you see <laughs> that, <minutes>. right, <laughs> you, you see that yeah, let's start there. there are no scriptures, all right, there are no scriptures. Those will be added later. This is to get us going, all right, and um, from time to time, I'll be stopping to, to make notes. Um, you know, this, I'm sure I'll th think of things as we go. So let's go through these, and I might have you look up some scripture for us. Uh, can I make an addendum comment about uh, one other new thing mm -hmm. uh, from the conference? Mm -hmm. um, when he talked about Old Testament prophecy, there was this new concept, well, it was new to me, but it, uh, probably newly titled, was the symbolic trajectory from the Old Testament yeah. of um, Old Testament right. symbolism, uh, whatever, a trajectory from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, okay. It falls into the category of the, the narrative type mm -hmm. of um, interpretation of the Old Testament. And he continually referred to God's quote storyline. Right. Okay. And that is a metaphysical narrative as, you know, interpreting all reality through metaphysical uh, narrative. Right. Okay. Which, uh, again, um, is uh, mythology, and we think of mythology as superstition. No. Mytho mythology is more ancient than orthodoxy, but mythology has always been the, the creeds and confessions of the philosopher kings to make the, um, you know, as mediators of true knowledge between whatever your God is, and the great unwashed masses, um, you have um, a mythology, which is a narrative that helps the great unwashed masses understand truth that they need to live by, very much like children's storybooks, okay? Um, you know, the little blue engine that could. Well, of course there's no little blue engine. You know, of course uh, trains are not personified, okay? Um, but this is a story narrative to help kids learn things on their level, all right? So um, this, you know, D.A. Carson admits, and they all admit, that orthodoxy is a, what we call a meta-narrative. Well, what's that? Well, it can mean grand narrative, but in this respect, it means metaphysical narrative, i.e. mythology. A story developed by the philosophers who have the ability to get past the five senses and see what's really true, 
Um, and they are the mediators then who have the wisdom to kind of hold society together. All right? And this is very ancient, very post Garden of Eden, probably the day after. It's the basis of communism. Really, it's the basis of, of socialism. All right? And um, so, when you get down, for the most part, people who, people who uh, learn and live by mythology, is taught by the gurus or whatever, they know that it's not literal truth. They know that it's a metaphysical narrative. Now, when you get into people who believe that the metaphysical narrative is literal, we call that what? Superstition. Okay, that's where we get superstition. When the metaphysical narrative, which is meant to be a parable to live by and not to be taken literal, all right? Then, you know, of course, Augustine comes along, and this was the very exact world view, uh, the, uh, spiritual, uh, the spiritual caste system of the philosopher king. Um, you know, he just took this exact same world view and, uh, you know, laid it over the Bible as a prism, okay? And from that, you have Reformed theology. Okay. Well, he was using a lot of the, uh, what we learned as types of Christ, the typologies uh -huh. of Christ, and uh -huh. expanding it upon uh, calling it a trajectory, a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament from Isaiah, from the Psalms, and he called it this symbolic trajectory uh, of prophecy from the Old Testament to the New, but there were many things that he was putting in that trajectory that I had never been taught was prophecy or typologies of Christ. It was like right. he was putting a lot of David's symbolism and a, and a lot of his psalms in, uh, in that trajectory and uh, finding parallel uh, accounts in the New Testament to put in there. I, th I thought he was kind of expanding and stretching that oh, concept. He was torturing to, scripture. To a, a, uh, an extreme and, extent. Right. And basically, this 20 minute diatribe he went on um, that was just torturing scripture to, to no end was all for one purpose. The light bulb finally went on. I'm like, man, this guy's killing me. You know, okay, what's he up to? And, and I'm sitting there listening to him, and I'm like, this is such a stretch. Okay, what is the agenda here? Ah, then we got to the agenda. He wanted to make the body, in Romans 12, 1, Christ's body and not our body. Because that poses a huge problem mm -hmm. if, if the Christian can present his own members as a living sacrifice, okay? He had to find a way to make that Christ. And unfortunately, there were a lot of people you could see sitting around, pastors even, oh man, oh well, I always thought that meant us, oh wow, man, oh wow, so profound, no. You you just got your metaphysical pockets picked, pal. Okay, and unfortunately, these guys are going to go back and... So, basically, uh, uh, basically, um, that's what inspired me to do this. Okay? Uh, we need to re redefine the terms biblically. All right? What he did by his own admission yesterday was eisegesis. He admitted it. He, he said, this isn't about scripture stacking. 
proof this is proof about texting, right? proof texting. Proof. This isn't about proof texting. This is about teaching you a world view, a way to view reality. Okay. Now, what we want to do, and I would love to call this project biblical theology, but that term's already been hijacked. I'm going to call it gospel theology. But it's eisegesis, and I need to make a note of that. Okay? Um, so, 31, I need to add that, um, a little note here, short little note there, and then uh, 32, um, exegesis. This is exegesis. All right. We do not see scripture. We do not see scripture as a matter narrative. Okay. We don't see every verse in the Bible as being that of justification. We don't believe that all reality is interpreted through suffering, or as Luther put it, all of the wisdom of God hidden in suffering. That's what he was. D.A. Carson, as you could probably reflect back now, was dancing all around that concept yesterday. Okay? Um, also, um, suffering was defined as temptation and just bad things that happen in general and God preordains that to grow you spiritually. That's not true. The Bible has very little to say about general suffering. Okay? Primarily what the New Testament talks about in suffering is suffering for righteousness sake. Okay? Live yourself and you know, if you live such a way, you're going to suffer persecution. Okay? So, basically, it's come time for, for us to redefine the terms and to put a theology out there, a different, an exegetical framework that people can, can hang the separate Bible verses on. Mm -hmm. Alright, tenet one. The word law pertains to the Bible and the whole counsel of God. Alright? Two. The word gospel pertains to the gospel of first importance and the whole counsel of God. Alright? Three. The laws in Romans 8, 2 are one law with different applications for the lost and saved. Alright? Four. Antinomianism is the antithesis of love and separates the written law from Christian living. That's our definition of antinomianism. Antinomianism um, is the separation of the written law from Christian living. That's what antinomian is. That's a good working definition. And that is not the reformed definition. The reformed definition is of antinomianism is somebody who doesn't revere the law. Okay? What's wrong with that definition? Because from the Reformed standpoint, what they say, oh yes, oh yes, the law is holy, the law is good, we revere the law. There's this book out, Friends of the Law, all about how Martin Luther was a law guy. Okay? Well, of course they revere the law. It's the standard for justification. But that's heresy. Right? You see what I'm saying? Okay? Our take is, is that we revere the law because it's the standard for love, not justification. See the difference? Alright, now. Five. Antinomianism is the official gospel of the kingdom of darkness and will be the predominant religion of the last days, which is what we're saying now. All right? The Holy Spirit, what, what we saw yesterday, was somebody making antinomianism look uh, truthy. Um, 
you know, I would say orthodox, but I can't, uh, because orthodoxy isn't uh, synonymous with truth. And I need to add that to the list. Uh, something needs to say about orthodoxy. Okay. All right. So where are we at? Six. The Holy Spirit uses the law, the full counsel of God, to change people. Only truth sanctifies. The Holy Spirit does not work apart from uh, the uh, um, the truth of Scripture, and I actually need uh, to add that in at some point. Okay. Seven. Um, here. Add. Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we hope we can get a lot of people involved in this. Plenty of people send me emails about this stuff, so basically it's time to nail it down. Seven. During the area of the old, during the era of the old covenant, the Holy Spirit was with believers and filled them for special tasks. During the New Covenant era, He permanently indwells them and fills them for special tasks. The permanent dwelling coincides with God's intentions to make Jew and Gentile one body. The visible manifestation of the Spirit on Pentecost was also a sign that God had grafted Jew and Gentile together. Okay? Um, eight, Old Covenant era believers were born again apart from the permanent indwelling. How do you like that? Okay, um, this means they had uh, the seed of God within them apart from the permanent indwelling. Okay, how do we know that? Well, before Christ even went to the cross, uh, he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. So the new birth preceded, do you see how this causes a huge challenge for people? Um, be, because uh, there were right, the Old Testament believers were righteous recreations of God apart from a, a permanent indwelling of the believer. Okay? Um, now, I'm not saying this isn't going to have to be tweaked, this, that, and the other, but I want something, this, to, to be something. Christians work together on and formulate together. That's why I'm putting it up as a project. Okay? Um, nine, saints are righteous because of God. Saints are righteous because of God and new creaturehood. Saints are righteous in and of themselves, though it is a righteousness that comes from God um, as a gift. Alright? Alright. Eschatology is soteriology. Eschatology is a stated gospel. Okay? Um, eschatology is not, quote, secondary truth. Um, it's gospel. Alright? Uh, what we believe about how things end should match our view of salvation. Alright? It's not secondary. Um, and that's why it's 25% of the Bible. 11. Epistemology is divided into two categories, secret things and revealed things. Man is able to understand the revealed things and is responsible to apply, apply revelation to life. To, to hear D.A. Carson talk about it and imply yesterday, everything really, I mean, did you take this away from it? Really, we can't know anything. Okay? Alright? Um, Alright, 12. All three members of the Trinity are fully involved in the plan of salvation and its execution. And all three members are fully involved in our sanctification along with us. If both are Trinitarian. 13. God preordained the plan of salvation completely separate from man, but man has a role in accepting the gift of salvation. Alright? 
14, justification and sanctification are completely separate. Justification is a finished work that is offered as a gift. Sanctification is a progressive work that re receives rewards. Justification and sanctification are separate and distinct according to gift versus reward. And this is this element right here, this tenet, number 14, is the, you know, if I'm pronouncing this right, this is the magnum opus. Okay, it absolutely, tenet 14 is the magnum opus. Why? Because in the book of Hebrews, someplace, the Hebrew writer said, God is not unjust to forget your love and good works. And if you break that sentence down, it's the idea that God would be an unjust in forgetting our, quote, our love works and good works because it's owed us it's a reward okay it has to do with rewards okay um, this that verse in and of itself in Hebrews totally uh, totally sets the orth the reformed orthodox dog on fire just you know uh, just does complete violence to the whole construct. All right? 15. Christians will not stand in a judgment that confirms justification. They will stand in a judgment that determines rewards. Only the eternally condemned will appear at the white throne judgment. 16. The four parts of soteriology, uh, the doctrine of salvation, are definitive sanctification, justification, progressive sanctification, and redemption. All right? 17. The covenants are building blocks that create the full picture of God's plan for the ages. They are also promises. The covenant is only fulfilled when the promise is fulfilled. 18. The new covenant is better than the old covenant because the new covenant is an ending of sin and the old covenant is a covering of sin until faith comes. 19. The sins of the old covenant era believers were imputed to the, to the old covenant. And then the old covenant purpose of the law for believers was ended at the cross. The sins of those who now believe are no longer merely covered but ended. This is because Christ went to the cross to end the law, and therefore all of uh, the sin imputed to it as well. Now, do you begin to see where, in, unless you interpret Romans 8-2 as one law with two different applications, really the, whole, the rest of the Bible is thrown into total turmoil, okay, because of, uh, because of this. All right. Um, where where did I end up? Nineteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Twenty. Where there is no law, there is no sin. Therefore, the saints do not sin against justification. In regard to justification, look. Just take that comment by Paul alone. Where there is no law, there is no sin. The only way to make sense of that at all okay, is to see Romans 8, 2 in the way that I explained. Where there is no sin, where there is no law, there is no sin. Therefore, the saints do not sin against justification. In regard to justification, the saints are perfect because there is no law. Their sin is against love and the family of God, which grieves the Holy Spirit, who has sealed them until the day of redemption. Um, and man, this whole thing of when the Holy Spirit was sent on Pentecost to permanently indwell believers is absolutely huge because the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit probably couldn't indwell us permanently until the law was ended. Does that make sense? And then, of course, it was time for the Gentiles to be grafted into the commonwealth of Israel and the it, permanent indwelling of the Spirit with the specific manifestation on Pentecost that was used later to prove to the Jews that, in fact, the Gentiles were being grafted in, okay, uh, 
the the permanent indwelling would have then served that purpose to unite Jew and Gentile together as one body. All right, it's all the timing is uh, not coincidental. Um, let me see here. Okay, twenty. Where there is no law, there is no sin. Therefore, the saints do not sin against justification. In regard to justification, saints are perfect. There is no law. Their sin is against love in the family of God, which grieves the Holy Spirit, who has sealed them until the day of the redemption. Sin, the word sin, must be qualified according to these different perspectives. Okay? Sin isn't just sin. Okay, the way an unbeliever sins and the way a Christian sins are two different things. Okay, 21. Creation and the body are not broken. Okay, all right, D.A. Carson yesterday pretty much made it clear um, that, um, you know, creation was totally fallen, we are totally fallen. Use the uh, word broken more than once. Right. Well, what he said was, is, is the world isn't just fallen, it's God damned. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know. Okay, you wanted to make that point very strong. 10 at 21, creation and the body are not broken or inherently evil. They are weak. Okay? The body can be used for holy purposes by the believer. You see where Romans 12, 1 creates huge problem for uh, uh, total, uh, total depravity and uh, the uh, complete inability as far as man's will. The creation moans with us for redemption. Remember when Paul said that? All right. If, um, if creation was completely fine, see, we read the Apostle Paul and we say, see, why does Paul say all of this weird stuff? All right. Then you start discovering what kind of theologies Paul was up against that day. Now you understand exactly why Paul makes it a point to say that the creation moans and groans uh, with us, longing for the day of redemption. Well, if creation was totally fallen, and if creation was, quote, D.A. Carson, God damned, all right, then why would, um, why, why would creation be longing for redemption? Okay, so it would it, it would have no way to have that desire. Right, exactly. And you say, well, that's weird. Creation has a desire to see the second coming of Christ. Yeah, well, you know, can that be taken literally? Well, that's not the point. But when you start, you know, when you start learning and thinking about. Because like I've said before, this Gnosticism that these guys are teaching is exactly the same Gnosticism that Paul was up against um, uh, in the first century. So now we begin to understand why Paul says these things in the New Testament. All right, 23. The Old Covenant still serves the purpose of an imputation for unbelievers. Though that role is ended for the for believers, because Christ died on the cross to end the law, the sons of unbelievers are still imputed to the, quote, law of sin and death. This is the law that condemns them, and they will be judged by it at the great white throne judgment. When one believes, all of their sin is ended along with uh, the law. They are no longer, quote, under law, but under grace. The latter involves being led by the Spirit according to the same law, but for love without condemnation, all right? And this theology, like all theologies, is meant to, to keep in mind as you're reading your Bible, and when you see in your Bible 
uh, conversation uh, that, that fits on this framework, you write it in, okay? And in that way, you're testing it to see how valid or invalid that it is, all right? 24, obedience, submission, etc. are synonymous with love. Love and obedience cannot be separated in sanctification. If Christ, if Christ obeys the law for us in sanctification, because our sins are only covered and not ended, the Christian cannot love God, they are still under law. All right, 25. It is not enough to believe in the historical facts of the gospel of first order, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We must also believe in the promise that we follow Christ in the literal death of our personhood that was under the law, and that we are resurrected with Christ to serve the law of the spirit of life. It is the belief that we have escaped the condemnation of the law and are now free to obey the law in loving service to Christ and others. All right? The standard is the same. The, the Bible, okay, it's the same law. For the unbeliever, it condemns. For the, for the believer, it's, it's our guide to loving God and others. Uh, as we are helped and illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Here, let me make this point. John uh, 14. Listen to this. Okay? John 14, 15. Christ said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 16. Next verse. Okay? And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. All right? Why does Christ say that? All right? The Holy Spirit, listen, the Holy Spirit uses this and nothing else to help us love God. All right? If you have something wrong in this that you are teaching, if you have something wrong in this, that you are trying to apply, the Holy Spirit is not involved. Don't accuse him. Don't accuse him of being involved in it, because he's not. If you have Scripture wrong and you're making the wrong application, okay, you're slandering the Holy Spirit. All right. You're saying the Holy Spirit's with me on this. All right? No, He isn't. Okay? If you want to rob a bank, go ahead and rob a bank. But don't go around telling people that the Holy Spirit helped you do it. Okay? Now. God gets credit for a lot of things that He wasn't intended on getting right. credit for. Right. <laughs> 26. Those under the law produce wages of death and fruits for death. Those under grace produce rewards and fruits of righteousness guided by the law and the, and the Spirit's help. Um, I thought about making a distinction between this and good works because unbelievers can do good works, but I don't know how I want to word it and I don't know if I want to try to do it. All right. Tenet 27. This is why unbelievers are indifferent to the law. Listen. This is why unbelievers are indifferent to the law. Why believers love the law. Psalm 119. Merit of some sort is not the issue. Love is the issue. When we are told to not live by a bunch of do's and don'ts, we are really being instructed not to love. Okay. 28. The law encourages us with promises, gives us hope, teaches us about God's purposes in history, and teaches us how God thinks. Even though the applications of God's purposes change over time, the fundamentals are the same. For example, we may not apply certain civil laws of the Mosaic law to our present lives, but God's purposes in those laws may certainly have an application for us today. Mm -hmm. 
We do not have slaves in our culture, but a Christian business owner may apply the principles of some of those civil laws uh, to his, hers business, i.e., it is important for people to get rest. Overworking people, or for that matter, animals, is a moral issue. Just because Christians are not under specific applications of many Mosaic laws, it does not mean that the information thereof has no application for us in this day. That's today. In fact, there is always a principle to be applied, although the application may be different. The application may be applied to an employee rather than a slave. This is why all scripture is applicable to the Christian life. Now, this is why when people say, oh, so, so you believe all scripture is for Christians today. <laughs> okay, you, you believe it's all one law and it condemns unbelievers and it's our God for love in this day. Okay, well, oh, you, you're wearing clothes that have seams and buttons there, dude. That's a violation of the law. I just want to hook them right in the stinking nose. Okay? I, I do. I just, it's like, <laughs> you know, um, let me give you an example of this, okay? Um, another example. The, the examples could go on and on and on and on. Uh, hold on just a second. Okay. Um, there was a YouTube video going around. of some young girl who had a five gallon bucket full of puppies that had just been born and was at the side of a river taking them out of the bucket and throwing them in the river. Okay? So, everybody's on Facebook. That's stinking wicked bitch, you know, string her up, she, you know, you ought to, she ought to have bamboo strips shoved up her fingernails, on and on and on and on and on, and so, okay, uh, what are you so upset about? That's wicked, dude, says who? Says who? Okay? Um, by whose law? It's wicked! Well, that's your stinking opinion. Alright? Obviously, it's not her opinion. And she's having a good old time laughing. Okay? What makes that wicked? Okay? Um... Well, let's go to the Mosaic Law. Hello, if you have to keep a Sabbath day, and Exodus says this specifically, it might be Deuteronomy, someplace in the law it's specifically stated as to why. One reason there's a Sabbath, and that is not only to give servants a day of rest, but animals a day of rest, all right? You know, to overwork animals is um, God doesn't uh, like it, okay? It's immoral in God's eyes. Well, obviously, if it's even immoral not to give work animals rest, how much more wicked is it to... Uh, you know, throw puppies in the stream. It tempts me to get a bucket of puppies and go to the edge of a stream and start throwing them in the river and saying, well, you know, do you keep the Sabbath? <laughs> you don't like this? Well, do you keep the Sabbath? It's the same reasoning. Do you see this? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, 
there's an Old Testament law. Um, do not muzzle the ox that treads the grain. I guess the oxen that they tied to a post and went around and around and pushed this. Well, you know, you'd have all of this grain laying around on the floor, so what these greedy, stinking uh, grain farmers would do was muzzle the ox so they, you know, couldn't eat the grain or, or whatever, all right? Um, you know, they would muzzle animals, work animals, so that they couldn't stop and eat whatever they were that was harvesting. Well, do you know Paul uses that same uh, scripture that, you know, it had an application for that day. God says, it's my people, it's my nation, in the land, this is the rules for farmers. This is the rules for this, this is the rules for that, this is our civil law. And here are the punishments. Okay? Um, well, we're no longer under a theology. But do you know what Paul used that script, uh, verse of Scripture for? Um, for a case for paying pastors and make sure well, not pastors, elders, that the needs of elders in the home fellowships was met. Okay? Um, so what's the reasoning there? Well, okay, it had an application back in that day. What are the applications? Well, it's civil law, and don't mistreat animals. Don't mistreat my created beings. Okay? So basically, Paul has an application in the first century for pa pastors. Yo, if, 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 if it's immoral to not give an animal its due, how much immoral it is to not make sure the needs of elders are met. And then he added to that, also, what Christ said, a workman is worth his hire, or something along, along those lines. Okay? Also, you know that whole verse of Scripture that Peter says, be not deceived, I think Peter said it, be not deceived, God will be, will, you know, will not be mocked. Okay? That verse of Scripture, read that in context, that's, that's about, that's about not making sure the needs of elders are met. There were home fellowships not meeting the needs of elders, and uh, they were mocking God. That's the context of that, if I remember correctly. But I think I'm right. Okay, now, where was I? Okay. You see now why 2 uh, Timothy 3, 16 and 17 can now say all scripture is profitable for da 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 that the man of God is fully equipped. Okay? Now if the word of God fully equips us, okay, that makes the Holy Spirit using the word to move us along spiritually. Okay, uh, it's the word uh, that fully equips us that the Holy Spirit uses to help us, and the Holy Spirit prays for us. We know that. Okay, uh, as well. All right, twenty-nine. During the tribulation period, God will send angels to enforce the covenant that was originally made with Israel at Mount Sinai. This seems to be instigated by the covenant Israel makes with hell, which will be annul. Isaiah talks about it. Uh, and we know this covenant with hell is the, the, the covenant national Israel makes with the Antichrist. It's a protection covenant. Okay? Uh, this seems to be instigated by the covenant Israel makes with hell, which will be annul. At the end of the tribulation period, which marks the beginning of the millennial kingdom, God will completely consummate the new covenant, which will entail the writing of the law on the heart 
uh, hearts uh, of every, uh, or the heart of every uh, Israelite. Again, same law, but unlike today, it will not have to be learned by Israel. They will teach the law to the nations and will be the head and not the tail. All of Israel will be saved. To be a citizen of Israel will be part and parcel with eternal salvation in the millennial kingdom. 30. The new heaven and the new earth will usher in pure righteousness. Heavenly Jerusalem will, des will descend from heaven and God will dwell with man. This is the city that Abraham looked for. Okay? Um, and it is the bride of Christ, not the church, by the way. Okay? So that's it. And people will be able to log on and fuss and discuss this and, and develop it. And add and take away and, um, you know, add, add take add away. Add scripture and references to uh, Add the scripture references and so on and so forth.